Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 20th session of virtual shadowing. Today's talk is a specialty spotlight in anesthesiology with Dr. Trousdale. Uh, can, yeah. Wait, can we stay on the first slide? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions about the program, feel free to contact us on Instagram at virtual shadowing or email us at virtualshadowing at gmail.com. All of these sessions are recorded and posted online on our YouTube, which is at pre-health virtual shadowing. Next slide, please. Here are our upcoming sessions. So next week, we'll have a specialty spotlight in psychiatry. The week after that will be another specialty spotlight in neurology and radiology. And on 11.3, on 11 we'll have research in medicine. Join us on our YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for these sessions. Next slide, please. Here is the virtual shadowing working group comprised of Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Elena, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, and myself. And we're also fortunate to be joined by Dr. Raymond Fowler and Dr. Brian, Brandon Norchetti. Next slide. Uh, did we delete the Q&A slide? In any case, uh, we have, there will be two Q&A sessions uh, throughout the presentation, one in the middle and one at the very end. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat if you're on, whether you're on the Zoom or the YouTube Live. Uh, please hold all questions about the quiz until the very end after the second Q&A. We will post the, Q &A, the quiz information at the very end. Just as a reminder, these sessions are about 1.5 to two hours long. And everyone, please turn your mic videos off. With, with all that said, please welcome Dr. Trousdale. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Rohit. Um, my name is Dr. Devin Trousdale. Um, the title of my talk is Rerun the Halls. Um, this is less of a lecture and more just a description of kind of the cases that I've been involved in as an anesthesiologist. Uh, if you count medical school and residency a little bit, uh, certainly residency, I've been practicing as an anesthesiologist uh, for about the past 20 years. If I write a book someday, it's going to be called We Run the Halls. And the reason why I chose that title is because we're one of the few specialties that really sees every single side of the, the hospital. We're not just confined to the operating room. Uh, we are in the OR. We're in proceduralist rooms. Um, we have clinics that we run. I, there's a, a pre-op clinic that I help run. But really, we can literally be walking down the hallway, as happened a few weeks ago, and there's an emergency airway called overhead, and we respond to it. So... There's not a part of the hospital that, that we don't uh, engage in, and, and there's no specialty that we don't engage in. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Management at UT, UT Southwestern Medical Center that's in Dallas, Texas. Uh, but my main place of employment is at uh, Parkland. So I have no disclosures to report. I have no um, monetary compensation or sponsorship. The one thing I do want to emphasize, though, is that I will discuss real cases. These are real clinical cases that I was involved in directly. Um, I've changed some of the details. I won't really mention the locations as much. So uh, there's not really any personally identifying information. And in the Q&A session or at the end, I'm, I'm certainly willing to talk about any case, uh, including these that, I, that I've had, uh, because I believe that as anesthesiologists, in a sense, we perform in public. We uh, provide anesthesia for family, friends, and loved ones. Um, we cover emergencies, and so I feel like if, if I have access to those patients uh, in a public setting in that sense, then uh, certainly uh, you all are welcome to learn about those patients. So this is me today. So I'm married. I have two little girls. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be doctors yet, uh, but I'm known as Dr. T in the halls of Parkland. Um, it was a long journey to get here. I grew up in Texas. I'm not gonna worry too much with my uh, life story before medicine, but I was born in Houston. And then we moved when I was pretty young to Austin. Austin's kind of our second home. And then around high school age, we as a family moved to the Gulf Coast. And then I got accepted at age 16 into a uh, early admissions college program called the Texas Academy of Math and Science. That's a school within a school at University of North Texas. I chose this map because um, it shows Denton. So it's in Denton. Um, and then, after two years there, I went to Austin College, and then my last semester at Austin College, I studied in Mexico, was accepted to medical school at UTB Galveston, which is also on this map. Uh, but I also was accepted to a what's called a Thomas J. Watson Fellowship 
uh, foundation fellowship, which I, I talk about, it, can talk about as well. Um, and so I deferred medical school for a year to travel on a, on a paid scholarship, came back to the U.S., went to medical school in Galveston, briefly went to New York uh, for a surgical fellowship, but really settled down in Dallas uh, to do a anesthesia residency, which I finished in 2006. And then for a year after that, I stayed on as junior faculty and worked as a uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia um, fellow. I became board certified in echocardiography, was in private practice for nine years, and then um, found my way back to Parkland where I've been the past five years. Uh, on the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, uh, Foundation Fellowship, uh, like I said, I traveled from my first day I flew into Mexico, traveled every means of transportation possible, private planes, commercial jets, a uh, ferry boat. I hitchhiked for periods of time. I walked for periods of time uh, through pretty uh, uninhabited areas. I wouldn't do that again. Um, and I went all the way down to the tip of South America, came up through Argentina and left through Brazil. So I did that for a year, then started medical school. On that trip, I had many opportunities to volunteer. Um, I was robbed a few times. I was stuck in the middle of a hurricane and then went down to the coast and didn't really pay attention to the news and was stuck in the middle of a tropical storm. <laughs> Uh, so there were some dangers involved, uh, but I, I got to brag and, you know, say I went all the way to the end of the Pan American Highway, which you can see here, to the end of the road. Uh, saw many beautiful sights and uh, even got stuck in the middle of a revolution. That's a young lady uh, running away with a, a gasoline can there, so if you can't tell. So uh, many adventures uh, and ended up at Parkland. So Parkland is where I've been the past five years. I'm an attending physician, which means that I teach uh, trainees all the way from residents to uh, medical students and to uh, pre-med students. I have a pre-med shadowing program where I have college students from the North Texas area that come and shadow with me. We can't do that at the moment. And so um, this is an opportunity for us to kind of virtually uh, shadow. Um, when I say I teach, I mainly teach by doing. I, I have lectures that I give, but the bulk of my teaching is just like today. It's in the operating room directly teaching, which is how I like to learn. Um, let me move my slides ahead a little bit. So how did I really get here, my medical journey? So some of you may recognize this, maybe one of you, uh, Dr. Fowler may. This is from a <laughs> show called uh, Northern Exposure. And it was on when I was in high school. And it's about this guy that uh, he goes to a small town in Alaska, becomes a family medicine doctor. So I travel for a year, I go to medical school, and uh, I, I quickly find out that not only do I not like family medicine, I don't like being in a small town, and so I was cured of that idea pretty quickly. The whole way that I got into anesthesia in the first place was I had a fraternity, I was in a fraternity and I had a fraternity brother that said, hey, um, I'm graduating, I'm leaving this job, uh, pay $7 an hour, it's easy money, work as an anesthesia tech. I had no interest in anesthesia. I just wanted to earn $7 an hour for six hours a night. And uh, I did that and probably within my first few shifts, I was like, this is what I wanna do. People were excited to be uh, on call. There was this camaraderie, it's like being on a team. And so I went from thinking I'd be a, a small town uh, family medicine doctor to uh, maybe I'll do cardiac anesthesia or pediatric, an pediatric anesthesia. So very big difference. So one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is do what you like, do what you're good at. I know that sounds very simple, but that's what ended up happening. I kind of ruled out, as we say in medicine, the things I didn't want to do. And there are people in medicine at my stage that they, they don't like what they do but they've undergone so much training. That's kind of why I recounted all the stages I took to get here because it takes many years to get to, get to where I am. Uh, and they don't like what they would do, but what they do, but they're kind of stuck with their choices. Or what's even worse is when they would like to do what they do, they've, it's been their goal their whole life and they're just not as good at it as they thought they would be. And so what do you do if you're kind of a, a mediocre you know, surgeon or, or cardiologist or anesthesiologist? So you want to be really honest with yourself as you go through your training and figure out what it is that you think you will like for years and what you think you'll be good at. And that's hard to know at that stage. So just a few little learning objectives. This is the last slide that looks like a lecture. Uh, so do what you like, do what you're good at. I'll hit that theme a few times. Uh, recognize the unique role that anesthesiologists have as consultants and also the unique ethical situations that that entails. Uh, I'm gonna introduce a concept called the misery quotient. This is something that I came up with that I'd love to have a discussion about, and this is kind of my first audience to discuss it. Um, I feel like it's a great way to view patient care. Uh, I'll discuss the primacy of, of the patient in all interactions, the role of high acuity, high stress, and anesthesia, and we'll learn some anesthesia along the way. So 
let's fast forward a little bit. You're in medical school and, uh, or let's say if you're a nurse or pre-nursing student, you're uh, in CRNA school and you're sitting down at, at uh, Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and you're thinking about anesthesia and you have some know-it-all cousins. Well, one cousin says, well, I know about anesthesiologists. They make a lot of money. And then your other cousin who knows everything says, well, I hear they have an easy life and they're done by two o'clock every day. And uh, they travel all the time. They have an easy life. And then your aunt chimes in and says, well, yeah, but they get sued a lot and they pay a lot of malpractice. So on remuneration, um, I will say as a physician, it's, it's hard to be a physician and, 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 and not do well in the sense that when you factor out your, your debt and that sort of thing, uh, you shouldn't be starving. Um, I have done well as an anesthesiologist, but I really don't get into focus on, on that aspect of it because if you do what you like and you do what you're good at, um, then you'll always be happy. And I know that's very easy to say, but it doesn't matter how much you get paid uh, as a physician. If you're miserable, you're going to be miserable and, and paid well. Um, that was a factor I mentioned earlier that I went from private practice about a decade in private practice to academics. There are many things that I like about private practice, and I try not to discourage the residents from going into private practice. But as I became older and I had my two daughters, uh, my time became important, uh, more important to me than money. And so I was finding myself in this small practice where I was leaving my house uh, before sunrise. My girls were still in bed and I was coming home and they were still asleep. So I could literally go days without seeing my daughters. And so that began to weigh in on me. And it's one of the reasons why I went into academics and I, I like the schedule that I have now. Um, also, I would say that that can change. If you go into a especially a super specialized area of medicine and you paint yourself into a corner and you get good at one thing, if that one thing doesn't get compensated well because of insurance changes or whatever, competition from, from allied health professionals, then you don't wanna be in something you're miserable in. So, um, so your cousin is a little right in that sense. Um, I do like the fact that I have time. Um, I have time to travel and do the things that I enjoy. We, we speak about what's called continuity of care in medicine. And that's where if you're like this doctor in Northern Exposure in the small Alaska town, you can uh, see the same patients all the time and you get to know them from, from cradle to grave. Uh, but I decided that's not what I wanted. I wanted the ability to see patients and when that patient is done in the recovery room, then, then I'm done with that care. And so uh, that affords me the opportunity to uh, travel a lot. I can take a week off. I can take two weeks off uh, and travel and do a lot of things that I wanna do. I, I, for example, this weekend, I'm, I'm gonna work Thursday night uh, I'm going to be off Friday and we're going to go to Austin, which is kind of our, our second town and, and spend time with my family, uh, um, our extended family. So I like the fact that I've chosen a field and it actually was a fact for me choosing anesthesia that I can do those things. I spent a year traveling after college. I, I'm glad that I can do those sort of things. As far as the hours and the time off though, where your know-it-all cousin is wrong is we have surgeon's hours. So we typically start our day at 7 a.m., 6.30 a.m. We have long hours. Today I was done by three, uh, but tomorrow I'm gonna work till probably 7 p.m. Uh, the night after that, I'm gonna work all night. Uh, last week and I worked for 24 hours straight. So we do work long hours, but because it is a shift type work, uh, we can get days off here and there in a way that other people can in other specialties. Now I put this slide in here because this is a trip that we took to Portugal. And if we have time at the end, and I'm gonna try to make sure there's time, uh, I'm going to explain why I'm not in the photo. I'm taking the photo, but I'm not in the photo. So this is a family trip we took to Portugal, and it's kind of a crazy story. So again, if we have the time, and I'm going to make that time, I'm going to tell you about the uh, what we call the Portugal debacle in my family. So then your aunt's totally wrong. So in the 80s, uh, we did pay a lot of malpractice. So adjusted to today's money, and this is um, from a slide from the 2019 ASA from Dr. Jeffrey Cooper, we used to actually be overrepresented in malpractice. So in today's dollars, we paid about $42,000 a year. Now we pay between five and 10. I paid about 9,000 a year. And that's my own money. That's a check that I wrote over here. So that's not a small amount of money, but it's a relatively small amount compared to other specialties. So your aunt's wrong. We, not only do we not pay a lot of malpractice, but we don't get sued all the time. We pay some of the lowest rates in malpractice. So we're one of the lowest payers in malpractice, not the highest anymore. Um, the other thing too, is if you do get involved in a lawsuit, first of all, we don't get sued that often because what we did between 1987 and 2000, well, before 2019, what we did around 1987 was we created this committee called the Closed Claims Project. And as a specialty, we literally reviewed, this is not meta-analysis, uh, abstract data. This is literally looking at every closed claim that we could get a hold of, not we, because I was 12 at the time, but as a specialty. 
and said, okay, what did we do wrong here? What did we do wrong here? So we individually looked at every single case where there was a close claim. A close claim is basically someone gets sued and whether nothing happens or that goes to a court of law or settles, whatever, that's called a close claim. So in any incident where an anesthesiologist has been sued, uh, they, they looked at it. And, and out of that came some significant recommendations that almost made overnight are especially much safer. It's the reason why we have pulse oximetry. It's the reason why we treat pregnant patients in a, in a more aggressive uh, way medically uh, when we have complications. We greatly improved our care. So I'm proud to say that I participate in a specialty that uh, is extremely safe. And so we don't get sued all the time. And what that means is there's a really high bar. It means that no matter how sick a patient is, no matter how complex or dangerous the surgery, the patient and their family expect to live through it. And so that puts a lot of pressure on us. Uh, now, I've been involved in one lawsuit. I can discuss it because it's now closed. Um, it was basically involved with a uh, known complication of the procedure, but the patient was angry at the surgeon and I got named in it. The thing about lawsuits is uh, if a surgeon or anyone is named in a lawsuit, anyone involved in the care also gets named. And so I got named in the lawsuit uh, basically by virtue of the fact that I participated in the anesthetic. And thankfully, I performed at a high level of care. I knew when I reviewed the chart that I did everything like I do all the time and uh, did not deviate for standard of practice. So uh, just know that when you're involved in a lawsuit, not only does the surgeon or the person you're involved with get named, but you get named as well. And that's kind of the quandary of the consultant uh, that we're involved in, in that uh, we don't have a lot of control over our situation. So earlier I mentioned that you can literally be walking down the hallway and there's an airway emergency. Uh, when I was early in private practice in my training, I heard an overhead call. I walk into the CT scanner. I don't know this patient from Adam, but I end up running a code. And so we can get involved in difficult situations and high stress situations that can be either nobody's fault. It could be the patient's fault. It could be something caused entirely by the proceduralist. So if they get sued because of negligent care and you came in and saved their life, you can still get named in the lawsuit. Uh, again, I don't think that way. I don't think in terms of, uh, you know, fear and risk and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's just something that's unique about our specialty. The one thing you do have to understand, though, is you're not the man or the woman, meaning uh, the patient is not there to see you. So you're not the most important thing. And I was describing this to some students earlier this week, that your job is, is to not kill the patient. It's to not harm the patient. So um, unfortunately, what that means is you don't get a lot of uh, thanks, right? Sorry, this is okay. Uh, you have to have thick skin. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit later, but last week I was involved in the care of a patient that nearly died in the operating room because of what's called an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, it was not something we caused per se, uh, you know, it just was a reaction to a drug that was unknown. Uh, we saved her life. And thankfully the surgeon trusted me enough to where when they put that patient back on the schedule, uh, she trusted me to do the anesthetic. Now, what I told my resident though, was I said, you know, in private practice, uh, what happens is, and it's, I think it happens every time looking back on it, is that something happens with the patient, they have some kind of unique, terrible reaction, anesthesia, whatever, it's something that's not your control or your fault, or aspiration, I had a patient aspirate, uh, and it was not uh, something I contributed to. Almost invariably, um, you save that patient's life, you cancel the case, whatever you do, when that patient gets put back on the schedule, uh, they ask to have someone else do the anesthesia. And so you just can't let it affect you, you can't let it, uh, you know, insult you. Uh, I probably did the first time, uh, but that's just the way it is. So they're not there to see you and your, your basic level of competency, your, the bar is to not do harm and, uh, and you don't get really thanked for it. So the first case I'd like to discuss uh, is a 78 year old female. Uh, and I'm gonna just introduce what some of these terms mean. So she was, uh, this was on a weekend. Uh, this patient was on my schedule. Uh, she was 78, she was bed bound, a uh, nursing home patient, uh, full on dementia, didn't know her, her name, her location, time date. She had what's called peripheral vascular disease, which is where uh, she had a foot infection and she had a foot infection because the blood flow to her right lower extremity was occluded. She had high blood pressure, she had diabetes and it's a Saturday morning, I see it on my schedule, I show up at the hospital at 7 a.m. for 7.30 start and we're gonna take her to the OR for a rife, uh, what's called a femoral popliteal a bypass uh, surgery with graft for a right lower extremity infection. Now, uh, I'm not happy to do this surgery because it's probably gonna be a five to six hour surgery. And it's an, a patient that, you know, is like I said, she's demented. She, she, she doesn't know, really understand the care that we're giving. The family is signing all consents. 
And I noticed that she's not DNR. So if you know what DNR means, it means do not resuscitate. That's an individual decision that patients need to have with their families, but it basically means this family in their mind believes that if something untoward happens, if the, the, their grandmother stops breathing or heart stops, whatever, then they expect the nursing home or the, the hospital to do everything possible to save her life, even though her chance of recovery is extremely small. So that kind of tips me off that their expectations for, for care may be um, heightened. Um, so DNR basically means do not resuscitate. And so we commonly find patients that probably should not be resuscitated just from a medical therapy standpoint and survivability. Uh, and it's often a discussion they haven't even had with their, their family. So the story was the family had been pressuring their doctor all week. The doctor really didn't want her to go to the ER. The doctor's uh, PCP is pressuring the surgeon. The surgeon doesn't want to do it. And finally he relents and then he puts her on the schedule that morning. Now add a little further intrigue, uh, we go to pick her up in the morning and she's completely covered in feces. And so I'm not sure how good the nursing home care was, um, but they didn't notice that. And so we canceled the case because she could have an infection. So I think, okay, my Saturday's clear. Um, and then that Sunday morning, they overnight, they put a rectal tube. I mean, they put a plastic tube in her rectum so that she can drain stool and her body's clean now. And we go back uh, to do the surgery. So in thinking about this, for a period of time, I thought, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Uh, it's not something I would want to do. We, we tend to think in terms of quality of life. I would want to have this big surgery. I probably, if it were my grandmother, I'd probably talk her out of it. But just to get an idea what the surgery entails is you have a, um, take the area that's blocked and then you either use a native uh, blood vessel, which she didn't have uh, with her poor state of health or a graft. And so you graft and just go around. That's all that bypass means. Um, there were really, the only other surgical, surgical alternative would have been to amputate her foot. So her options were a treater with antibiotics and then she basically just dies of infection because if you think about it, if you have bad blood flow to an extremity and your tissue is not healing and becomes infected because that, then the antibiotics don't get there either. So the antibiotics are not going to be really effective. The other option would be to amputate her foot. That's a much quicker surgery, less risky. But then she could have phantom limb pain and eventually she's probably gonna still die of the infection um, as that peripheral vascular disease gets worse. This is really a last ditch effort and it's really for patients that are hopefully ambulating. Now, I didn't feel it was unethical, but I discussed with my wife at one point and she said, well, that was unethical. So if your wife says that, you listen to her. But what I can say is I don't think it was so much an ethical uh, quandary as I felt like this is not something that I would wanna do uh, if it were me. It's, it's a fairly big surgery for, for pretty minimal gain. So in preparing this talk, I wanted to, to bring up this case because I feel like it brings up a really good perspective on, like I said, quality of life and the way that we view patients. Um, maybe if I could have done things differently, I would have maybe sought a middle path, which would be to sit down and discuss with the family alternatives. But really when it's 7.30 a.m. on a Sunday and the family and the doctor and the surgeon want to do the surgery, unless it's truly unethical or wrong or just not indicated, then, um, you're not really in the position to say no. I want to also use this time to address the fact that the medical field, we're often rightfully criticized for, um, for not addressing these issues properly with patients, for not discussing palliative care, which may have been appropriate in this patient. However, um, as a cons end of the line consultant, as an anesthesiologist and possibly even for the vascular surgeon, we're not the people to do it. And that's not to say I want to get out of it, uh, of those decisions. I've had very frank discussions with people uh, with family members that have a sick family member or patient and they have a DNR order. They, it says, do not resuscitate, but we're going to take them to the OR for a risky procedure. And I explained to them when they're in my operating room, I am going to resuscitate them because that's what I need to do to, to help them proceed through the surgery. Um, what I would say though, is that as much as the medical field does get criticized, um, what I can say from the days that I was an intern in the ICU is that these discussions are not only difficult to have, but often the family is very hostile to that discussion because as a, not just an intern, but certainly as an anesthesiologist, if you begin to introduce the concept, which I'm very comfortable talking about anything, I, I've never been afraid to discuss any subject with the patient or family. Um, but if you introduce that as the anesthesiologist, they wanna have the surgery and to them, it's, to them it indicates that you don't have faith in, in, in the surgeon or that you're just not interested in them living or surviving the surgery. So it's difficult to do that, have the discussion, and then go to the operating room. Again, I don't plan my life around uh, getting sued or not getting sued. What I can tell you is that 
um, it's it's just not our, our position to do that. So we're often putting these really difficult uh, decisions um, that we don't have control over because we are kind of end of the line consultants. So furthermore, I think I, there are perhaps colleagues I would have that would cancel it because they wouldn't feel like it was right for the surgeon. But I wanna ask you to think beyond binary choices, not just cancel or, or to cancel or not to cancel. This is a discussion I have in the pre-op clinic all the time that I have with residents all the time is your goal every day is to ask yourself, how can I safely perform this anesthetic today with minimal delay or without cancellation? I've taken some very sick patients back to the operating room who are not adequately tuned up to my, to my liking, um, but I, I would rarely cancel the case or postpone it if I felt like canceling or postpone it would cause more harm. And there's some people, uh, colleagues that occasionally would get out of having to do a big case because they don't wanna do it. Um, and so what I would think, ask you to do is think beyond those binary choices this is a bioethics professor that I had in college that uh, he introduced this concept to us where he said, he introduced a, a clinical case where he said, you, everybody in the room was split between A or B, when really you can think of a creative middle path. Uh, and as I mentioned, just last week, I had a patient who was uh, nonverbal, was completely dependent on her mother uh, for all decisions, basically was, you know, like a baby to this mother. And we pushed drugs for induction, intubated the, the patient, and uh, she had an extreme and anaphylactic reaction to the anesthetic. And it's rare that I'll cancel a case, but I felt like proceeding with that surgery, even though she survived that initial insult, uh, could have possibly caused more harm because it was a laparoscopic procedure. So we did decide to cancel the case and, and uh, take her to the ICU intubated with the breathing tube. And then we put the case back on the schedule uh, two days later. She did fine. But generally what I do is I try to find a creative way to to still proceed with that procedure. And I'm gonna explain why in a moment. Always put the patient first. Um, this again is a discussion I often have in the pre-op clinic in a county system, especially if you cancel a case and uh, it can be any kind of surgery, but let's say you go to see a patient in the pre-op area and the potassium is 5.2, it's not normal. And you're worried about higher potassium levels. You should find a way to treat that or to you know uh, manage that instead of canceling the case. Because what happens is patients take time off from work. You know, their, their sister comes in from Oklahoma and takes time off work to help that patient rehab their, their uh, hip replacement over the next few weeks. People make tremendous adjustments to their life. And so if you come in and you cancel the case because of some little thing, uh, then you're disrespecting that patient's time and their, and, and their life and certainly the surgeons. When I was in residency, my father had open heart surgery. My program was, it was elective. My uh, program was very gracious about providing me time off. They were giving me two weeks off and about a week before the procedure, we get a call from the surgeon's secretary saying, I'm so sorry we made a mistake. The surgeon's going skiing that week. We're gonna have to reschedule the surgery. I wasn't mad at her. I understand these things happen, but we'd made tremendous arrangements in my life and my father's life through his work. He was still working at the time. And uh, so I'm very aware of that. And then if you compound that with cancer, if someone has a cancer diagnosis, uh, I took care of a patient a few years ago that, um, she really was as tuned up as she could be for surgery. She was diagnosed in February of that year, but she got bounced around our various clinics because all these specialists wanted to make her just right, uh, even though that wasn't really, shouldn't have been the objective. And uh, by the time she came to my OR was in November. So, you know, potentially nine months had, had been, eight to nine months had been delayed in her care over a time sensitive diagnosis like cancer. And her labs were not great that morning. And I told my resident, I said, we're not gonna cancel this case today. Uh, she was extremely high risk and it was a very, you know, kind of white knuckle experience. But I said, there's no way I'm going to cancel this lady again because she needs to have the surgery. And I know if she gets bounced out today, it's going to take months. So you always put the patient first. And that, that means often making really difficult decisions. I want to take the discussion a little further uh, from the nursing home patient and introduce a concept I call the misery quotient. Um, to my knowledge, this has not been trademarked, uh, or maybe it's copyrighted. Um, so first of all, ALS, I'm going to use a clinical situation. This is not a patient I've taken care of. This is from an NBC News article. Uh, but I'm going to give the example of a patient that has what's called ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's a progressive nerve system, a nervous system disease that causes a gradual decline in motor control. Um, I'm going to ask, I know Ray Fowler knows, but I'm going to see if one of our, our coordinators knows the other name for ALS. There's kind of a famous common name for it. Does anybody know that? Uh, think baseball. Think yeah. baseball. 
Think baseball way before you were born. Think Yankees. <laughs> so it's called Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, that's the common name for it, but it's, we call it ALS or amyotrophic lateral later, later sclerosis. It is a progressive nervous system disease. Uh, by the time people get diagnosed, it can take years or it can be a pretty rapid decline. In Lou Gehrig's case, it was about a year and a half, I believe, between when he was diagnosed, quit baseball, and then died. Uh, the treatments were different then, but there, there really aren't great treatments for it. it it's still, you know, essentially a death sentence. But the reason I'm introducing this is because, first of all, it illustrates two things. One is this headline from this article says, uh, here's the dilemma. Should he end his own life? So it's probably about euthanasia or die slowly of the disease. So it's two bad alternatives, right? End his life prematurely or just let himself die uh, slowly and the implication is miserably from the disease. Well, that's if we use this concept called quality of life. Quality of life is a cultural concept that we use in our society. We use it as physicians, as nurses, uh, but I'm gonna introduce a novel concept, what I call the misery quotient. So the problem with quality of life is that it's too subjective and it forces one to evaluate the life of another through the lens of our own experience. So if I'm looking at that nursing home patient, first of all, uh, I don't think there's great harm in, into the, in that patient, the, the one that I, we did the fempot bypass on, she did fine, survived the surgery. Um, but it's not my quality of life and it's maybe not what I would want for her grandmother. She's the patient in that scenario. But the other harms are just uh, just as bad in terms of dying of an infection or an amputation and having something like phantom limb pain. I consider the family's quality of life too. But if you look at it from a quality of life perspective, uh, then you could say it's not worth it, just let her die. And I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's kind of where the path that quality of life leads us to. It could be the right or wrong answer, but what I'm gonna introduce instead is what's called the misery quotient. And the way it works is that every single interaction we have with healthcare involves some amount of misery, some unpleasantness. And I mean everything. You go see your doctor, maybe a little nervous. You get the, a blood pressure check. It squeezes your arm. That's unpleasant. Unpleasant. Maybe you get a shot. But the, the benefit is, is worth it. This is not a risk-benefit discussion, though. It's all from the patient perspective. So I'm being a little facetious. But when my daughters go to the pediatric clinic and they get shots, if you ask them what the misery quotient is, they'd say it's very high because the shot hurts and I don't see the benefit. So from a kid's perspective, there's no benefit to getting shots. And so we can say the MQ or the misery quotient for the interaction is, is quite high or maybe too high from a kid's perspective. But let's think a little bit more seriously and think of someone that has uh, metastatic breast cancer for the third time. The first time they had surgery and chemo and they, had, they were in remission. Then the second time they were in remission for six months. Now it's the third time around. And the best that the oncologist can offer is no surgical treatment because it's widespread chemotherapy that's going to make them feel miserable. Oh, and by the way, they can maybe extend their life for another month. The quality of life perspective says, well, that's not worth it. I mean, that's how a lot of people would say. In fact, if you compare uh, physicians to the average patient, if a physician is given a essentially terminal illness diagnosis, they're much more likely, much less likely to uh, take the kind of aggressive care that they have prescribed for their own patients. Again, that's the quality of life. But I'm gonna introduce a different concept. And what it says is, yes, that's a high amount of misery for a small amount of benefit. But let's say that that chemotherapy patient, the breast cancer patient, let's say that two months gives her time to go to her son's wedding. In the picture, I have two twins and these are hypotheticals, Bill and Bob, okay? So the MQ quotient, the MQ says, Bill on the left here uh, is an orthopedic surgeon. He played football under a scholarship. He loved to play sports. He uh, He's declining in his abilities. He's having trouble operating. He's getting in trouble with the, the hospital committee and he's not sure why because he's, he's, he's making mistakes. Um, he goes to see a doctor and the doctor works with him, finds out that he has ALS and he knows what that means. Uh, and he says, you know, I can't give you an exact time, but it could be months, it could be years, but you are rapidly declining. And so that it's a Friday and that Friday, the bill goes to see his wife and he sits her down. And he says, look, here's why I'm having trouble. I'm tripping and I'm having trouble operating. Uh, I have ALS and, you know, they cry for a little bit. And then he says, but here's the thing, I'm not going to suffer. So I closed my clinic down. I wrote a letter to all my patients, uh, thanking them for the time that I had with them. Um, we're going to buy an RV and we're going to travel around the country and we're going to, we're going to enjoy the last few months that I have. Maybe we can go skiing this winter, but, but possibly not. Um, he enjoys sports. Uh, he enjoys eating and, and, and drinking, doing all of these things that are difficult to do with ALS. So he tells his wife, I'm not going to be on a ventilator. Uh, I'm not going to have a feeding tube. I'm just going to enjoy the things that I enjoy doing for the rest of my life. That's a quality of life perspective. His twin brother, Bill, is also diagnosed with ALS. 
he has the same scenario, except he had a totally different background. He didn't go to college on a football scholarship. He went on an academic scholarship and he was smart. So he went to UT Dallas and he's a writer. So he never played sports. And not only is he a writer because he enjoys it, he wakes up early every morning, every morning uh, and writes a local column. He's published books. It gives him joy, but it's also his, his source of income. So he sits down with his family and he says, look, uh, I found out I have this terrible diagnosis, but I can still type. I talked to the doctor and he's getting me set up with an appointment. Uh, basically, I can continue to write for a pretty long time. And if I can't type, then I can do voice recognition. And if I can't do that, then uh, I can even type with my eyes. But I want to write as long as I possibly can until my dying breath. And I don't mind having a feeding tube or being on a ventilator. So his MQ is quite low. His misery that he's willing to, to endure for the benefit is the opposite of his brother's. And so I think when you take that perspective, the misery quotient says, it's not a decision-making process that a committee would get together and say, this person deserves life support, or this person should be taken off life support, or should be on a D half a DNR. It's simply a way of looking at a patient from their difficult clinical situation, from their perspective with empathy. So it's an idea I've kind of bounced around for a while, and I wanted to introduce it to this audience, because once I started thinking in those terms, uh, it kind of changed the way I thought about things. This is a man, uh, another quiz question, but I know who this is. One of perhaps arguably the most famous cosmologist in the history of science. Right. And cosmologist does not mean he cut hair, just so people know. <laughs> it's cosmetologist. <laughs> so that's Stephen Hawking. And when I was preparing this talk, I, I, had a, I thought maybe he had, a, had ALS, but he would have survived way too long for ALS. Because again, ALS is a fairly, it's a more rapidly progressive disease. He actually had motor neuron disease, so he did not die of ALS. He was actually, I did a little reading on him. He was diagnosed in the 60s. And I believe his then girlfriend, fiance, uh, he told her and they married. And uh, from the six, 1960s until quite recently, he lectured, he published, he traveled, he was able to communicate through computer uh, uh, device. Uh, he, he made an appearance on The Simpsons, maybe more than once. So he made incredible contributions to the world, to science. And I mean, he's a, he's a giant in that sense. Um, and while it's not the same disease as ALS, because again, that he had what was called motor neuron disease, his MQ was quite different. It was quite low because he was willing to live with quite a lot of misery to get quite a lot, extract quite a lot of benefit from modern science. So just a way of looking at things from the patient's perspective. So we'll open it up to questions uh, kind of in the middle of our discussion here. Um. Boy, have we had a lot of questions about lawsuits and uh, litigation. <laughs> They've been pouring in. <clears throat> um, but Devin, if you don't mind, sure. God, what a great discussion about Stephen Hawking and about your the two brothers that went the different path about the misery index. Uh, I work with an organization in Texas called, it's now called Texas Talks, but what it's about is helping people <clears throat> just just like we plan life for babies to come into this world, that people can um, very carefully plan the end of their lives also uh, so that they don't have to be miserable and uncomfortable when they don't want that. Uh, and I couldn't help but think when you showed, uh, firstly, the, the brother who decided that he, he would keep on keeping on <clears throat> until his last breath, Stephen Hawking, of course, who when essentially completely par paralyzed, did some of the most important computations about black holes, especially the Hawking radiation, which is how black holes evaporate. He did all this in his head. Mm -hmm. um, and Beethoven, of course, stone deaf um, for the uh, uh, first uh, playing of, the, of his final and ninth symphony that you know, it just depends on what's misery to you. So how do you take, I'm sorry to talk so much, Devin, how do you take that approach to your patients to, to help them be able to sort through their options? So from my person, and I am interested in palliative care as well. I, I volunteered with the hospice organization for a while. Um, what I can tell you is, as an anesthesiologist, kind of in-line consultant, um, I'm not part of that decision-making process and I'm fine with that. Uh, but I always tell the trainees, you're still a physician, right? If you have a patient that's a smoker, um, for one thing, I don't wag my finger at them. I just say, you know, if you could stop smoking today, that'd be great. Um, I try the gentle coercion technique. So by the same token, um, if there's an opportunity to talk about that with the patient, then, then I will. 
but um, it's very difficult for us as anesthesiologists to be part of that decision-making process. What I use it for instead is just generally to treat the, uh, teach these medical students that as they go through their training, whether it's anesthesia or not, that you, you just have to focus on, on things from the patient perspective. Our, our average science education at Parkland in our county is about third to sixth grade, something like that. Our patients understand, if you explain it to them in a way they can understand, they understand the medical science of, of their interactions and what's going on. They may not have sometimes even a high school education, but, but they, they're intelligent and they understand these things. So what I do is I always emphasize the patient is front and center. So one of the things that I do uh, in my pre-op lecture, and I do this in, in practice, is that when you talk to a deaf patient, for example, you're told by the deaf interpreter to not look at the interpreter, you look at that patient. So I've extended that. When I talk to a Spanish speaking patient, for example, and there's an interpreter, I don't look at the interpreter, I look at the patient. If I'm talking to a patient that is, uh, let's say they're late stages Parkinson's and the spouse is doing all the talking, I always make sure to emphasize to talk to that patient directly because they may not be able to communicate with me. They may not even be able to register what I'm saying. They may have dementia. But as you know, one of the um, sequelae uh, of, of Parkinson's is that it's accompanied by depression and that depression is compounded by the fact that people just tune them out. And so the, the, the wife may, you know, the spouse may be doing all the talking, but I always make, tr make sure to engage and interact with that patient as much as possible because I don't want them to be boxed in. And I don't always know, uh, like last week when I had the nonverbal patient, uh, I don't know what she's getting. Um, but, but I just treat them like they're my, you know, as if they are even, even more extreme. I had a patient on GI service a while back that, um, it was a very odd May, December relationship. It was like late teens and like, like the guy, she was in her late teens and the guy was in his, her husband was in his sixties. And, uh, it was odd because every single question I asked her, she turned to him and asked him. And I'm, I'm even including like, have you had nausea and vomiting? And she's like, have I had nausea and vomiting? So there was some really weird dynamic and there may be some abuse, um, but I'm gonna treat her like she's the, the most important person at that time. So it's really, really just a way of thinking about uh, things from a patient's perspective. Um, I hope that answers, answers your question, but it's, yeah. it's, my whole approach is to, is to do that. I, that's wonderful, Devin. Um, a lot of questions on the cost of liability insurance. And I was, would you mind speaking to the issue of tort reform and, and like we have in Texas? And sure. So and I'm going means? to, maybe I'll surprise you, but um, I have a lot of friends that are lawyers and I respect them and they're, they're involved in tort. I actually feel like the pendulum has swung too far. It is, um, and you may have a different perspective being in the emergency room. Um, one, I don't, I don't manage my practice from a uh, scared of my own shadow the way that some people do. Like I do what's best for the patient and apply a high standard of care. So that way, if I'm ever involved in a situation like the one I was involved, uh, the lawsuit I was involved in, I know that I can look at that chart and say, I did the right thing. I didn't do something ridiculous or dangerous. And so Prop 12 was passed probably about 12 years ago. And it was a tort reform measure to reduce malpractice, uh, payouts. And in that sense, it was successful. We, we pay less overall in Texas. Um, the, and to get into the details, it's, you can, uh, there are three incidents or occurrences or I forget the exact verbiage, but basically the maximum you can be sued is 250 for each occurrence, 750,000. It sounds like a lot of money, but it basically became a barrier that was uh, not enough for a, a law firm to, for many law firms to, to take on. Um, if, uh, because of all the other associated costs. So I know that sounds like a lot of money, but uh, it didn't end all lawsuits, but it, what's ended up happening is in Texas, it means that it has to be something pretty egregious and negligent. Uh, now, having said that, I'm a little bit critical of the law. It's benefited me in some ways. I think there's a, again, a middle path. It's not a binary choice between suing or not suing. There's what's called uh, the Michigan way. And uh, you can look that up on Google after the talk. Um, I may have some literature, but basically the University of Michigan found itself in the situation that we did in anesthesia where they were paying a lot of money as, as an institution for lawsuits. So what they did was they have this, this bifurcated approach. They say that if they review uh, a, an incident and they find that one of theirs is at fault, then they go to that patient or family and they one express remorse and apologize and two they offer some kind of metered payout and that usually bypasses a, a lawsuit entirely 
the downside of lawsuits, uh, aside from getting sued, is that it's a lengthy process. It's minimal two years because you wait until that two years of uh, data discover discovering all these things. And so it's a long drawn out costly process. And so patients are very happy with this. Now, if they review the case, the incident and they find that one of their own was not at fault and it's egregious, then they fight it tooth and nail. Uh, if it's a shakedown, then, then they fight it. And so I think it's a very reasonable way to approach uh, malpractice. Um, and I don't know if it's been adopted at other institutions. It actually has saved them money over time. And so, um, that's one thing. Secondly, again, I'm not a, a CYA type person where I, I'm, I'm just constantly doing ridiculous things to reduce malpractice. Um, but what I will say is in Texas, uh, under, under state law, if you express remorse, if you apologize to the patient or family over any kind of occurrence, whether it's your fault or not, that cannot be used against you in a court of law, meaning an apology is not an, uh, an acceptance of guilt or culpability. Now, if in your apology you say something outrageous, like "Well, I killed you know killed your mom on purpose," then uh, you know that's kind of beyond beyond remorse and apology. But what that means is, practically speaking, and this is in Texas, so I can't speak outside of Texas. Uh, it means that I've been able to practice the way that I've always practiced since I was an intern, which is when any bad thing happens, I've always been open and honest with the family and patient as much as I possibly can. Now, sometimes you don't know if it's your fault. So you don't want to just go out there and gush or whatever, because when, certainly when you're in your training, you think you may think it's your fault when it's not. And sometimes you have to wait until there's more information. But I've always been upfront and, and honest and open with, with patient and family. It's never harmed me. And I can tell you the older generation uh, that I trained under were very clear that their philosophy was to circle the wagon. Uh, not only is that bad, I think, for patient and family, but, but we know from data that if you circle the wagon and basically avoid them and say nothing, than to the family or the patient that thinks that they think that you're trying to hide something. And when they think you're trying to hide something, then they may actually make it more likely to sue you. So it has never done me wrong to be um, upfront, open and honest, even admitting mistakes um, because they know that we're fallible. I, I just knock on wood, I've been doing this for 20 years and it, it, it's worked for me. Um, changing tracks. Um, I, you know, by, by the history, the, the pain scale is a very ambiguous scale. And, and how do you navigate that with a patient? You know, the guy walks in looking fine. He says, what's, what's the problem? He says, it's my back. Right. And on a scale of one being the least and 10 being the worst, what, it, what is your pain? He says, oh, it's about a 10. And you look at the guy and he's not writhing around or this sort of thing. And I, I want to say, no, a 10 is this hemostat in your earlobe. <laughs> right. So I mean, it's a little, yeah. So two, a few things. One is I, I'm not in a pain clinic setting where I would, so usually when I'm treating someone's pain, unless it's an emergency, I usually I have the benefit that you guys don't have in the ER, which is there's, there's some barriers in history taken. So by the time they come to me, I probably have a better idea of what their pain is. Now, a few frustrations. One is you're exactly right. So I'll just tell you guys when I was on my year long trip and only did I get robbed a few times, but I had to have emergency uh, surgery in Nicaragua uh, under local. And it was quite painful. It was sur surgery my jaw. So that was 10 out of 10 pain. I'm just going to tell you all I cried at the end. <laughs> I called my grandmother and cried. So that's 10 out of 10. So, uh, you know, the patients will say 11 out of 10. And what they're trying to say is they're trying to get it. Uh, they're trying to get you to treat their pain. It doesn't mean they're attention seeking. A few things I would tell the young audience here is that you have to approach these patients as if they're speaking to you honestly, with the idea that sometimes they lie or exaggerate. Having said that, you have to learn to treat pain with pain medicine and non-pain medicine in an appropriate way. I learned uh, almost the hard way when I was on acute pain service to get to the really original point, right? in that we had a patient that no matter what we did, they were nine out of 10 pain. And then we had to get to a point where like, you know what, you're just gonna have to live with some of this pain because we're giving you such massive doses of this infusion that you'll never get out of this hospital and you're gonna be addicted to this drug. Like I came, I think it was Dilaudid, it was like a milligram. It was some crazy amount. And so there's that component. So a lot of what we do is counseling the patient and saying our goal is not to make you zero out of 10 pain. We were affected by this in my training. I know it was part of your training, but but I was at the crux of it in medical school where we were, were told that pain is the what fifth vital sign, what, whatever it is. And we were just hammered with this idea that like you have to keep a patient pain-free. And so I had to learn, and I learned in my specialty that you can keep a patient pain-free sometimes. 
Uh, that having been said, one thing that I've really come to realize is when you have a patient that has either an active history of heroin abuse, for example, or a past history, and they wake up and it's not a very painful procedure and they're screaming in pain and they're crying, they're not actually attention and drug seeking. They're not faking it. I, I've really come to understand that one, for one thing, when patients become addicted to heroin, oftentimes it's because they have trauma, right? They have, they were abused. They had something so horrible in their life that heroin is what they take to, to mask that. Um, and secondly, they literally interpret pain that for me would just be discomfort because again, I had my jaw worked on in Nicaragua, you know, on a, on a rainy night. So, uh, so, but in all seriousness, they, they really do interpret a broader range of noxious stimuli discomfort is pain. And so you have to treat it adequately. It doesn't mean you give them, you blast them with two of a lot, a lot at every time they, they wince. It just means that what I don't do is I don't discount what they say. So if I say it's a minor surgery and they shouldn't be in pain, um, because as you know, we don't have any kind of monitor that really tells us if a patient's truly in pain, you can't look at, at vital signs. Patients can have totally normal heart rate and blood pressure and be in tremendous pain. So you can't, and I've heard people say that, well, they can't be in pain because their heart rate's 60. Well, they can be, they can be on a beta blocker. They can have normal vital signs and they can be in 10 out of 10 pain. It's probably not true 10 out of 10 because they didn't have what I had. Um, but it's a subjective, it's a subjective evaluation. But I think the most important thing is again, to see it from their perspective and not to just discount them because oh, they're a heroin user. Well, they're a heroin user for a reason. So what's your biggest challenge as an anesthesiologist? That's I'm a glad general you, question, but... What, I'm glad you asked that. So Sartre said that uh, hell is other people. And what I tell the trainees is that uh, after 20 years, so first, this is when we had in class, real class, right, in a conference room, I would say, did you drive here? Because we're in Dallas, we all drive. We don't really ride the rail or anything. And they say yes. And I said, did anyone pat you on the back because you drove here today? And they say no. And I said, okay, because you know how to drive. You've been doing it for a few years. Anesthesia <laughs> should be like that. Every day that you're in the, in the ER, for example, Dr. Fowler, um, you'll get some surprising cases and challenging cases, but not every day is Dr. House, right? And so it does become second nature. And so the thing that's difficult and that's a challenge day to day is not the anesthesia side. I'm gonna actually address a little bit of that in, in my talk in a little bit, I'm glad you brought it up. It's the people, right? It's other people. It's dealing with difficult surgeons. It's dealing with the difficult nurse. It's dealing with the, a patient's family member. It's uh, the interpersonal interactions that we're just now learning that we should teach. We don't select for that very well. We look at your scores, we, we interview to make sure you're not crazy. Uh, basically that's the purpose of the interviews is make sure that you can hold a conversation and not be crazy. Um, but we don't do a great job of selecting who are these applicants for this specialty in anesthesia in particular, can they resolve conflicts? You know, um, so I, that's a big part of what I do. That's the biggest challenge is not the anesthesia, it's the, it's the people. I truly believe and feel <clears throat> I'm a second career guy. I did the first uh, half of my career here in Georgia where I'm sitting at the moment and the second half at the university where I've just made the best friends of my life. Uh -huh. it's, it's difficult and present company, including a lot of these folks on here tonight, it's, it's, it's difficult to describe in full detail how important relationships are in the working world of medicine, in my opinion. <clears throat> well, it's approaching uh, eight o'clock. You want to take your next half and sure. Let me let me get my notes back up here. My computer died up. Hold on, Give me one second. Okay, so we're going to change gears a little bit. This is still in keeping with the theme of um, the uh, consultant's dilemma. So again, we have very little choice. Give me one moment just to bring my thing up here. All right, one more time. Okay, now we're back on. Okay, so some of you may or not be familiar with this. This is Dr. Christopher Dutch. Can you see me again? Yes. Okay. Um, this was a local doctor in North Texas. He trained in Tennessee, but um, there's now a podcast on Dr. Death. If you're not familiar with it, you should listen to it. It's educational and informative. It really is. Um, it's about a neurosurgeon who um, completed his surgery training, his fellowship training, somehow graduated because it was evident he was not qualified comes to North Texas at some of the hospitals that I worked at. And uh, within short order, uh, I forget the exact number of patients he operated on, but other than his first surgery, which I'm convinced was a sham surgery, 
um, all of his patients were injured and some of them died. Uh, we're talking uh, paralyzed from the neck down type injuries. Um, I actually know the people, the, the surgeons and the nurses and the anesthesiologists that had to work with him to save these patients' lives as they were slowly figuring out that he was either intoxicated or doing it on purpose. Uh, it's a podcast you can listen to. Um, I bring it up though because um, obviously the 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 victims in this were the patients that were harmed, right? We talk about the second victim, and that's a concept I want to introduce. The second victim is obviously no one suffered more than the patient who was actually a friend of his that he paralyzed uh, by essentially cutting his, his spinal cord um, from the neck down. That's the victim, right? But the second victim in medicine that I've come to realize is the providers that are affected by a patient death or patient harm. The reason why I have this slide up here is because this is a talk that I give, or I talk about this professionalism, and uh, I, I saved this uh, slide from an old email that I've kept ever since. So this is my secretary asking me to take uh, Dr. Dunch out to dinner. Uh, my group wanted to recruit him because we wanted to cover a back surgeon. And the reply I gave was something like, ha I can't make it because I'm gonna be busy that night. Well, that evening was the evening that we induced uh, my wife for the birth of our first child. Had no idea who Christopher Dunch was and who he was to become. We ended up not going to dinner that night because we, we didn't have enough people. And so some other group covered him. Again, the, the victims and all of us were the patients, but my friends in anesthesia uh, had to desperately try to save patients' uh, lives that were um, being harmed by him. Now, that's an extreme example, and hopefully no one will ever have to work with someone like that. But what I can tell you is that it's difficult as an anesthesiologist if you work with a surgeon that is incompetent or difficult to, to work with, and you have to make those difficult decisions decisions, whether you want, want to cover them. There was one surgeon in private practice that we'd come across that just was, was not very skilled, was, I wouldn't say incompetent, but just I, I didn't feel comfortable working with. And I made a very clear decision. I wouldn't want to work with that person. It was one of my factors for going in academics. Um, my group honored my choices. So if I didn't want to cover a, a particular surgeon, they wouldn't put me with that person. And certainly at Parkland, now, if, there's nobody that I don't get along with, but if, but if there were, um, that would be honored. It's something to think about, though, and it's something that touches on um, not just um, anesthesia, but a lot of specialties in medicine. Well, in ER, for example, Dr. Fowler, I have a friend that's an ER doc, and he, he became very concerned about a patient that uh, anytime the patient had pain, and this physician saw him, they were going to get pretty much anything under the sun. And so he ended up reporting that physician to uh, the Texas Medical Board. It was very difficult. It's very difficult to, to do that. Um, this is an additional type of dilemma where uh, it was anesthesiologists and surgeons that were, um, they had created this hospital network called Forest Park. And they, all these people went to prison, by the way. Uh, they were basically just stealing money. And they, they um, pretty much regarded patients as just dollar signs. They weren't treating those patients, you know, pri the primacy, like I mentioned earlier. These were shady people that found each other. I knew these people. Uh, one of the surgeons, I'm not going to name the name, but I, I can speak about them because they're all locked up behind bars. Uh, one of the surgeons involved in the kickback scheme had asked me to cover a case of his on a, on a late Friday. And I just, I'd heard enough bad things and I just, guy gave off a bad vibe. And so my, my conclusion in all of this is that you need to protect your license. You need to protect your practice and you most importantly need to protect your patients. And so you don't want to get involved in the, in, with these kind of people. There are lesser sort of crimes, if you will. There was a, a hospital that had just opened up and there was a young patient in his third healthy patient. He was gonna have ankle repair surgery, totally healthy day surgery. I'm talking to this patient about how he's gonna go home that, that day. And the nurse pulls me aside and says, well, we're trying to get credential, blah, blah, blah. And so he needs to stay overnight for that, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know what, that's why I'm not gonna tell this patient that he's gonna stay overnight. I'm not gonna make him stay overnight. And I said that in front of him so he could hear it uh, because the last thing I wanted was the administration of that hospital told me he had to stay overnight and probably had pretty high medical bills for an un, a non-indicated uh, overnight stay simply because this hospital had to meet certain numbers to be you know, basically qualified to practice. Uh, we do live in a profit-driven system in the US. Um, I have my own views on how different countries do it differently and what we could do differently in the US, but I think it's hard to deny that the, the profit-driven side of medicine in the US does does sometimes skew our medical decision uh, making. I have a colleague that went to Canada for a, a, a conference and there's this big dispute in the US between uh, gastroenterologists and anesthesiologists over who should provide sedation. And we say it's for safety and they say it's for safety. And I, 
I think there's a great case to be made for the safety of having an anesthesiologist do it, but it's also a, a money discussion. And one thing that surprised me that he said surprised him was the discussion they had, basically they, they could have an honest discussion about it because their physicians are salaried. The GI doctors are, they don't care whether or not the, they bill for sedation because they don't bill for it and they don't charge anymore. They don't make any more money. And so they were able to have a, an actual honest discussion about it in a way that we can't. And in the same theme of, of uh, Dr. Dunch, uh, I would just say, um, you know, the hospitals were complicit in that. It took quite a lot of effort by Dr. Randy Kirby, who's a surgeon that I worked with. Uh, he's the guy that basically got the medical board to crack down on it. But the hospitals not only really didn't crack down on Dr. Dunch, but they let him pass on to other hospitals without informing them. So uh, they cared about the reputation, but they didn't, they didn't put the patient first. Um, so always put the patient first, the surgeon second, and you last. As an anesthesiologist, you have to swallow your pride. You have to have some humility. And again, as my, my, my friend told me many years ago, you're not the man, you're not the person. Uh, you have to accept that. You should always figure out a way to do that case uh, today without cancellation. So my second case, I'm gonna get to my third one too, <laughs> um, was a patient I did a few years ago. Uh, and this is, illustrates uh, a patient with extreme airway response. So, and I'll explain these terms for the students. So uh, this is a 28 year old male. They had in-stage renal disease. They had badly controlled high blood pressure. They were obese. They were asthmatic smoker, which yes, asthmatic smoke all the time. And he presents to the operating room for what's called an AV fistula creation on his left upper extremity. So what that basically entails is they take two blood vessels, connect them in your arm. It's just on the surface of the skin and that helps the vessel puff up. And then you can use that to get a dialysis. So his kidneys didn't work, he was on dialysis. Well, the case went badly very quickly. I do say anesthesia, I push the usual drugs, I intubate, meaning I put a breathing tube in, and um, I thought it was a pretty easy airway, and all of a sudden he starts to deset, and deset meaning his, his oxygen level on oxygen saturation went down. The other thing that happened was, uh, and I'll explain these monitors in a second, uh, was that his entitled CO2, which measures the carbon dioxide, went, blip, 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 went off. So usually when it does that, it means the cardiac output has dropped. Uh, I was pretty sure I was in his trachea, um, but my main concern was maybe he'd had an asthmatic reaction. I'd never seen one that severe. I listened to his lungs. I don't hear anything because he's morbidly obese. So not only do I hear anything, I don't hear wheezing. I don't hear anything. Um, I give albuterol, which is a, a drug that we give in the airways to open up the blood vessel, the, the airways it had no effect. And he's deciding quickly, 80, 70, 60, 40, and then blah, 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 and then nothing. Um, just so people know what reactive airway disease, it encompasses asthma, COPD, chronic bronchitis, it basically means that these small airway passages in your lungs, um, in response to an irritant or a stimulus, they can, uh, they can close. And they close because there are these smooth muscles that surround these small airways, as you can see, this is a cartoon. And when those become stimulated, uh, uh, they can not only close down these uh, airways, but uh, mucus is produced in an extreme allergic reaction. And then what happens in early disease is that CO2 or carbon dioxide does not get out of the lungs and gets trapped. And then later in the, in the process, you can actually impede oxygenation. Now later does not mean weeks later, it means not even hours, it can be seconds. So mild cases can be just a hard time getting rid of CO2 and more extreme examples can be poor oxygenation. So he had trouble with exhalation and then basically had no exhalation or inhalation. So uh, what to do? And what I will say is for a pretty long period of time, he had no oxygen saturation, despite my best efforts. I was working very fast and clearly to kind of ascertain. So one thing I did, and my friends thought I was crazy when I told them this, but I felt like it was an easy airway. Uh, I'd give him albuterol, but I thought, let me just make sure the endotracheal tube's not obstructed. And I'm not 100% sure I'm in the trachea. So I pulled the endotracheal tube out. I examined it just to make sure there's not some weird kink in it or a, a, a clot or a, a mucus plug. There's not, and I reintubate it. And now I know for sure I'm in the trachea. So I'll explain what these tracings mean. Uh, basically, this is what's called entitled CO2. Very easy term. Every living organism takes in oxygen and expires CO2 at the cellular level, tissue level, and the organ, organism level. Uh, so what that means is you consume oxygen, you breathe out CO2. We have a little monitor that measures the carbon dioxide at each breath. In title just means at the end of each breath. So a normal, oh, what's called capnogram, this is a monitor we have in every anesthesia machine, should go from zero to 35 or 40 roughly, just like elephants in a row. The pattern of the uh, capnogram though can tell us quite a lot. So if you hyperventilate, that number goes down because you're 
uh, if you're familiar with calculus, your the integration is the same under the, the curve is the same, um, but you're expiring less CO2 if you're hypoventilating, the opposite happens. But what was happening with him was in early asthma, if you can see here on the bottom right, there's a delay, meaning it takes a little bit longer for that, that carbon dioxide to be exhaled. Now, the internal CO2 monitor can tell us a lot of things. It can tell you if there's an airway circuit disconnect. So if you think about if the airway circuit gets disconnected, then that internal CO2 goes to zero because even though you're actually technically breathing out CO2, it's not being picked up by the monitor. It can show you if the endotracheal tube is not in the trachea. So for example, if you, if you put the tube in the stomach, which is not where it's supposed to be, you might see a few little bluffs, but that's also going to go to zero. It's also kind of a poor man's cardiac output. And if you know what cardiac output is, it's basically the heart rate times the stroke volume. It's the amount of blood that uh, exits the heart with every beat. So the right part of your heart, all it does is it carries blood that has poor oxygen and a lot of CO2 to the lungs. If for whatever reason, that cardiac output drops, either heart failure or a really low heart rate, whatever the cause, then your entitled CO2 can also go down. So what happened with him, so it can actually help you diagnose asthma, proper placement of the tube, an airway circuit disconnect, uh, even cardiac output. So it can tell you a lot of things. What happened with him was this, it went blip, 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 blip. And usually if you see that, it means you're in the esophagus because it went to zero quickly. And I checked, it was not in the esophagus, it was in the trachea. Then the only other alternative is that, uh, generally is that your cardiac output drops. So if you have a patient that crashes on induction um, and you see this blip, 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 that's probably the earliest, quickest indicator that uh, their cardiac output has dropped significantly and they may be in arrest. But that wasn't the case. This is the most extreme form of asthma that I'd seen at this point. So the reason why that giving albuterol through the airways did not help is because his airways were so clamped down that the albuterol could not travel to uh, the desired spot. So you go from the other direction. So you can give epinephrine through the blood supply. And so I kind of overthought it at the time. Um, so his cardiac output was definitely not down. His heart rate was in the 120s. His blood pressure was 180 over 110. He had no oxygen saturation, no entitled CO2. So he is not performing as a metabolic organism, except he has good cardiac output for some reason. So I was concerned at the moment of making him have a stroke because he was at high risk for stroke. I probably should have given him epinephrine. But what it instead was I asked for terbutaline. There was a pharmacy tech that was nearby. I got it within seconds. Um, and I asked the pharmacy tech, what is the dose of terbutaline? Because I don't know the dose. In fact, if you look it up today, there's no dose for just IV push. There's an infusion, there's uh, other routes of administration. And so I will just tell you, I took a 20 cc syringe, diluted it and pushed the entire vial through the IV. Now that sounds crazy and extreme, but uh, I thought the guy was basically dead. And so despite my best maneuvers, uh, he did not appear to be uh, exchanging any oxygen for possibly 10 minutes. It seemed like a really, really long time. And so um, thankfully I guessed well. So terbutaline is a drug that opens up the airways. It opens up the smooth muscle. Um, and what happened was it was like when Dorothy is like in black and white and then all of a sudden everything's in color, like it worked amazingly well. Like his entitled CO2 went poof, went up to like 90. So he was breathing again. It, I mean, it worked like, like a miracle. If I could do it over again, I would have given epinephrine because epinephrine does the same thing. And at low doses, it really doesn't cause high blood pressure per se. Um, and the advantage to, to, to epinephrine is that not only does it treat the problem that you're trying to treat, but it actually does what's called, it inhibits mast cell degranulation. So if you have a true anaphylactic allergic response, it actually prevent, it actually solves the problem, it actually prevents the allergic reaction. So it's a perfect drug, but I gave terbutaline. I went way off the range and uh, I got lucky and it worked. I, deba I debated whether I should tell you all that or when I've told, told residents I debated because it's extremely off label. Uh, but I feel like it's illustrated. Again, my life's an open book. I'll discuss anything. Um, so I feel like it was the right thing to do. So Devin, uh, is it true that anesthesia is 95% boredom and 5% sheer terror? It is. And the thing is, it comes in clusters. So I go weeks where I'm like, how did they even pay me to do this? <laughs> and then I have a week like last week where I had a really difficult airway and I'm screaming, not screaming, I'm saying words that I would, wouldn't share in front of our young audience. Um, I handle stress pretty well, but I'm basically saying blank, 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 blank. And we get the patient intubated. I had the, the, the daughter who's nonverbal that nearly died on us. And so they tend to come in like a cluster. So it's very boring at times. And so, um, so what did I do clinically? So let me ask you, I'll just ask one of you. Um, basically, we thought he had anoxic brain injury because he went, it seemed like an hour, it seemed like 10 minutes, it may have only been five minutes, but he went for a long time without oxygen to his brain. 
the surgery itself is not stimulating. Uh, however, so if we proceeded with the surgery, which he did need, then it shouldn't cause further harm. And by the way, there's no cure for anoxic brain injury other than just time and let the brain heal. So we decided to proceed with the surgery. I think it was the right choice. Uh, so we do the case. I take him to the ICU afterwards. I go to see him the next day and I go to his ICU bed and he's not there. And Dr. Fowler and, um, uh, blanket on the, on your, on the uh, other yard docs name. Sorry. Yeah. Morchetti. Yeah. Um, Morchetti. I'm here. Um, is that, um, oops, there's two ways you can go in the ICU, right? You can go straight up to the sky or you can get discharged to home. And so I was, a, I, I didn't figure it was likely he went home. So the nurse says he's in dialysis down the hall. I'm like, oh, that still may not be good. I go to see him. He's sitting up eating a ham sandwich. So the reason why I felt like it was the right decision is because the greater lesson I want you all to learn is that my feeling was the surgery itself would not have further stressed him, right? It's just under the skin. It's not a big deal. Um, so there's that. Secondly, he barely survived this, this routine anesthetic. What if that happens a second time? So the thing that I always teach my trainees is he paid for the price of admission, right? So he bought that anesthetic. And so I feel like to do right by him, we should proceed with the surgery, which by the way, he needs. We use this term elective surgery. I hate that term. We need to come up with a new one because it makes it sound like you could take it or leave it. This guy needs his surgery. My dad needed his open heart surgery to live. Is he dying at the moment? No, but these patients need their surgery. So I think uh, I think we made the right choice. This is a little did bit Kevin, more. Did, did, he quit, did he quit smoking? Uh, I'm going to guess no. I'm going <laughs> to guess never. And I hate to be a pessimist because I deal with vascular patients all the time and they'll break your heart. Uh, but uh, I'm guessing he didn't quit. So the third case, my last case, uh, is uh, I'm going to explain all these terms again, is ACE inhibitors and hypotension under general anesthesia. So this was a, and again, I'm making up some of these numbers and stuff, but she was a 47-year-old female. She had a thyroid mass. So we were going to take out her thyroid, routine surgery. She had high blood pressure and obesity, otherwise pretty healthy person. Um, so an ACE inhibitor is a medication that's used to treat high blood pressure. It basically blocks out the renin angiotensin uh, system that acts as and uh, what it also does, though, is patients that take his inhibitors or similar type drugs, they can have profound hypotension under general anesthesia. And that's basically what happened. So an ACE inhibitor, again, it's a drug that lowers blood pressure, but it's routinely seen that under general anesthesia, you can get profoundly hypotensive. So we induce her, we intubate her, everything seems fine. I leave the OR, and about 10 minutes later, I get a call from my nurse anesthetist. She's like, yeah, you got to come back here. I go back there. What had happened was the patient dropped about 10 minutes after I left. Her pressure was 50 over 30, was quite low for a period of time. My CRNA th was very quick to act, placed an arterial line, which is a direct blood pressure monitor. And then we treated the patient with what are called vasopressors. So the thing about ACE inhibitors and hypotension under general anesthesia is that it is a temporary phenomenon. You can get profoundly hypotensive. You can treat that with a blood pressure raising medication. Um, however, once you turn the anesthesia off, it all goes away. It's not long lasting. So let me ask one of the, the students here. Um, Rohit, I'll ask you, just because you're on my screen. What would you do? This patient was greatly hypotensive for probably 10 minutes. You're concerned about her brain function. This is an elective surgery. Would you proceed with the surgery? I guess my main question would be how, like, how necessary is it for the surgery to t take place? Well, what if it's you? How necessary is it? Well, I would, I mean, if it, Absolutely necessary. Like if it's, since it's a thyroid mass, I'm guessing this isn't life-threatening. Well, I guess would be potentially push back the surgery if it's possible. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what a lot of, I think my, I know a lot of colleagues that would do that. So I always say every, we have 27 operating rooms at Parkland. Every single patient is having a surgery that's necessary. Okay. If you have hip replacement surgery because you've had hip pain for years, and you need it to walk and to live and to do your job, it's necessary. And I'm not trying to beat up on you, but I'm just saying that, you know, unless you're doing sham surgeries, everybody that is having a surgery that day, they're there because it's going to save their life or affect their quality of life in a, in a positive way, right? And so if you don't do the surgery, you can probably reschedule it. But again, she paid the price of admission. And by the way, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, we're not going to cancel or take her off for ACE inhibitor because that's what's used to control her blood pressure. She has to have the surgery. It's going to happen all over again. Um, so the question then is, did she have uh, ischemia to her brain because of the hypotension? So this is what we did. Again, 
the surgeon wanted to cancel the surgery. She says, we don't have to do this today. Um, my CRNA probably, I don't know, didn't carry the way, but don't think in terms of binary thinking. I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we wake her up? We hadn't started the surgery yet, by the way. We, we'd just done the anesthesia so far. So I said, why don't we wake her up, see if she can move her fingers and toes. That's what we do routinely for carotid artery surgery. If she can do that, we'll put her back to sleep and then proceed with the surgery. She's not gonna have any memory of that. And it's, if she does, it's not any more traumatic or stressful than what we do at the end of each surgery anyway. So we do that, she moves everything just fine. We put her back under anesthesia. The resident begins to prep the case. The surgeon and I leave the operating room. We go to talk to the family. Again, upfront, honest with the family, uh, just like I said earlier. And we explain, hey, this is what happened. We think she's gonna be fine. She needs a surgery. They were totally fine with it. And the patient is fine. So I would encourage you, kind of moving into the next theme, is that one thing I tell my trainees is you will take care of risky patients in risky situations, okay? You have to accept that. And if and, and some people don't, and I've seen people that were smart and capable and talented, and they were a few months or a year into anesthesia and they decided it wasn't for them. Uh, there was a really smart guy that they came through our program a few years ago. I really wanted to work with him and make him a better anesthesiologist. He was smart, hardworking, but he had this deer in the headlight look anytime any crisis happened. And uh, he left and he went into pediatric or uh, pediatric psych psychiatry and he's happy there. So it's not for everybody. So what I would tell you where he is that we drive on the Audubon, right? This is a photo of the Audubon. Um, we're not given speed limits. So there are certain allied health professionals that if they're gonna perform sedation for say an echocardiography, for example, or for GI procedure, they're given speed limits. They're told you can only do this, you can do that. You can't do peripheral sedation because you don't have the training. Well, we have the training. So we can go as fast and as hard as we need to and that sometimes means taking really sick patients and, you know, really risking their life with the anesthetic because we need to get the best diagnostic uh, ultrasound of their heart or whatever, whatever the case is. So we have to be willing to take those risks. Um, just last week, well, the, the patient that I mentioned uh, uh, from a week ago, um, she nearly died. All she had was a 22 gauge IV, which is a tiny IV. We spent an hour trying to get another IV going on her foot. Uh, Parkland wouldn't place a midline after she was in the ICU. And so they put her back on the schedule uh, Wednesday. Her, her uh, IV in her hand got pulled out. So all she had was less IV than when I tried to do it Monday. And I told the, the surgeon, I said, we're going to do this today. I could probably put, place a central line that has some risk, but we're going to do it. We did it. We did it safely. So you have to be willing to accept risk and in a way that things may not be exactly perfectly the way you want them. Um, most extreme example I can give of this, and I don't want people thinking like a cowboy or I'm reckless, um, but I think some of my colleagues sometimes think that because I, they know I will never say no. I will never turn down a case if, it, if it's the right thing, if it's, if it's uh, indicated. Um, in fact, there was an evening where I was leaving and a colleague called another colleague who called me and said, well, Devin will do it. It was an uh, elderly woman who was gonna have an abscess drain, extremely sick and unstable, but the surgeon basically said, this is her last chance. If we don't drain this, she's gonna die. And she could die if we do it. So we need anesthesia. So I go and talk to the patient. Or I go and talk to the family. The patient wasn't really communicating. The daughter and the son were kind of our, trying to discuss back and forth versus DNR. And I said, look, we can suspend DNR in the OR if you want. I'll, I'll honor her because she's that sick. And the daughter kept asking me, she said, do you think you're, that my mother will die under anesthesia? I said, it's possible. Uh, but I said, but if you feel like this needs this surgery, if she needs this procedure, then we'll do it. She could die under anesthesia. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. So they said, we're going to think about it. I leave the room, I go down the elevator, I start to exit in the lobby, I hear a coat of red, and she had died. And so um, my resident was with me and turned to me and said, I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess you didn't have the chance to die in the OR. And so what I would leave you with is that I, I'm willing to take care of very sick patients, even if there's a risk of dying in the OR, um, if I feel like I trust the surgeon and I trust the patient and if they need it. I'm, I'm not gonna cancel a case because the patient may die. Um, unless it's an unnecessary risk. I don't take unnecessary risk. And then the last thing I will leave you with as I close um, is that one thing I lecture on frequently, this is one of my favorite topics is difficult patients, difficult uh, situations. You had asked earlier about what's the most difficult thing we do, Dr. Feller. And the most difficult thing we do is dealing with people. And um, that's an everyday learning experience. I give countless examples in real life of uh, times I've been on the wrong end. So I'm very honest with my trainees that I've definitely become a better professional and gotten better. Um, but um, that difficult personality extends not just to a difficult surgeon as we commonly think it could be. So for example, 
I always ask my trainees, uh, how many patients are we taking care of today? And they just kind of look at me like it's a dumb question and say one. I say, no, 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 no. Um, this patient's the easy patient. We're just going to put him to sleep and wake him up. The surgeon is going to be the difficult patient today. We're going to have to hold their hand. Um, a, few, or a few months ago, I had a patient that was young and healthy, relatively young and healthy. He had this triad of uh, nasal polyps, asthma, allergy to asthma. It's like a classic triad. Well, he was wheezing that day. And you don't actually get better with the wheezing until you take the polyps out. So you're not going to cancel the case because it's wheezing because the case is how you fix the problem. Anyway, he's wheezing. I can treat that. He's a young, fit, healthy guy otherwise. But the mother's like this and she's got her arms crossed. And I read the body language and she's peppering me with questions. She's anxious and she's not happy. And I tell my student later, I said, that's my patient. Uh, I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to work with her. I'm going to treat her. This guy is easy. Her son's the easy patient. Um, so you have as many patients as you have people in the operating room. And one thing I like about what I do is you have the opportunity to, um, to be a leader. Um, I've definitely been involved in some of those situations I've told you about where the patient is crashing, doing badly. And then what compounds that is the surgeon is yelling at you. If you have a panicky surgeon. Um, and, uh, but what I've learned is you just have to tune that out and just, and do your best and do right by the patient. So now in closing, closing my last slide, uh, what is a typical day like? Uh, there is no typical day. Uh, today I had a great, uh, two great vascular cases with my resident, a really great teaching case. Uh, tomorrow I'm working by myself um, uh, with the surgeon that's, I work well with everybody. He's known to be difficult, but I enjoy working with him. So maybe that says something about me that I, that uh, the, the difficult surgeons like me. Maybe, maybe I'm, a, maybe I'm a difficult too. Um, the hours can be difficult, uh, especially under COVID now. Um, for example, I don't mind doing cases by myself because I did it for 10 years, but uh, lately we're doing a lot of cases just on our own. And I actually enjoy it because it's a time to show the surgeon kind of who you are and your skill set. I was going to include slides about drug addiction and burnout and stress, but I didn't want to depress all of you. Um, I've personally known uh, friends and colleagues that have uh, gotten addicted to drugs and have overdosed and even died. Um, so I would like to encourage you to go on anesthesia, but just know that we are one of the higher risk specialties. ERs, ER, psychiatry, and anesthesia are, the, are really the top three. Uh, um, so it's, it's sad to see, see that happen to friends, but, um, you know, it's just a part of life. And, and, uh, again, I didn't want to lead with that in, in the talk. What I will say though, is that we had a maternal death two years ago. Uh, it wasn't my patient. I wasn't directly involved. I was actually on main call. And when you're, on, when you're on main call and you hear uh, cardiac arrest in OR9 or whatever room it was on the L&D side, that's always bad because healthy moms sh uh, should not have cardiac arrest. So I run over there, one of my colleagues and, and another colleague, additional colleague, were trying to resuscitate this patient. The patient ended up dying of something that was, it was just uncontrollable. It was, was called amniotic fluid embolism. Uh, but, you know, it greatly affected my colleagues and I, I'd be lying if I didn't say it affected me. And I made a comment later and said, you know, I just went right back to work that night because the way that I deal with that sort of thing is uh, I just start, I just work more. And my friend said, you know, that's not a good coping mechanism. And so what I did was I availed myself of the counseling service that our, our university provides. And I went to a few counseling sessions and I talked to the counselor about, you know, deaths that I've been involved in uh, directly or indirectly throughout my career. ER and ICU and anesthesia and a few specialties, um, you know, we, we have a number of patients die uh, compared to, you'd think it would be in obstetrics, but obstetrics, they, it's really, you can go through your entire training program without having a patient die, which I didn't even realize that until a colleague told me that. I said, I said we like life. We like to de deliver babies. Um, so when that, that mother had died, um, three of the fellows in the room and, and most of the residents raised their hand and said, I, I've never actually had a patient death before. And they weren't even involved in that patient. So it was, it was kind of eye opening. So um, I've tried, I try to live by example and I, I, I try to do the things that I, that I, that I wanted myself. So, and that's, that's where I leave that. So um, I'll open it up again for Q and A. We have quite a few questions. So one of the, one of the, a really popular question was, uh, can you share any cases from the recent pandemic that you've had? Um, yeah, so Ray and I were talking about this before the, the talk. I read about COVID all day. I, I, I just, I don't know, I, I feel like uh, as one CRNA told me, she's like, Dr. T, like you like facts, like you like information. 
And so what I can tell you is our perception of it has changed a lot. And so early in the pandemic, it was kind of scary. We had what was called the tactical care unit or the COVID unit is what we call it, um, where, we, where we isolated the COVID patients. So one patient in particular uh, was talking to the ENT surgeon. So it's common if you're on a ventilator for a long period of time to, be, to have what's called a trach. And the standard practice is for most um, respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation that at about week two, you place a trach. Well, the difficulty with COVID is you don't know how long they're going to be on a ventilator. It's not a, a well-known process, or at least it wasn't at the time. So some of these patients are on ventilators for a month or two months without a, uh, a, in a trach, uh, without a tracheostomy. And so they're noticing this unique phenomenon where um, they're probably having too big of an endotracheal tube placed originally, and then that tube and cuff erodes. And so they have these like greatly dilated tracheas that are really going to cause problems uh, later down the road. So, uh, so I've seen that. There's one case that I'm very proud of, and um, not to make too long of a story of it, but um, there is a surgeon. So earlier I said I work well with everybody. Well, there's one particular uh, obstetric surgeon that... Um, we had a very bad evening one, one night and uh, I'm willing to accept blame and I'm willing to accept my faults when I can. Um, but it was, the situation was, I was simply questioning something because it didn't add up the, the, they wanted to give a massive amount of blood. And I just said, I don't really see that much bleeding, but I said it in a very polite professional way. And this particular person was very uh, that agitated and upset them. And they were so upset about it that they complained and said, I was unprofessional on this. I will tell you though, I, I, I never bear grudges. Like I tell my residents, I tell everybody, if I have a bad night with you, it is like water off a duck's back. I, I, I just, I act like you're a different person the next time because I wanna well, work well with you. So that's kind of the, the background, right? Um, I'm still nice to this person, that person, you know, uh, whatever, doesn't think highly of me. Well, we get called to the, the COVID unit and we have a patient that uh, needed to have a C-section in the COVID unit. So her story was she had COVID. She was extremely symptomatic. Uh, she was on what's called na high flow nasal cannula. I mean, there's a nasal cannula here that's blasting 40 liters a minute of oxygen. That's a tremendous amount of oxygen. It has to be humidified. Um, and so I talked to my CRNA. I talked to the patient. I said, you know, I just don't feel comfortable doing this under an epidural, which is how we normally do it because I don't want to knock out your, your breathing. I think we just have to do this under general anesthesia. I'm the anesthesiologist. I'm supposed to be the expert on that. So my, the surgeon finds out that that's what I want to do. And she pulls me aside and she's very upset and agitated. And she says, you know, we know that these patients, when they get on a ventilator, they don't get off. And if you put her on a ventilator, she may never get off. And I've been with this patient every day. She has no trouble with her upper respiratory. She doesn't have a work, she doesn't have a work, a breathing problem. She has a hypoxemia problem. And, you know, normally the obstetricians are not very knowledgeable about that sort of thing. But I thought about it. I put away my pride and my ego. I know people that would have just dug their heels in. And I said, you know what? I said, that's a reasonable solution. I said, we'll try to do it under, well, there's no try, right? Like Yoda says, there's do or do not do. I said, we're going to do this under epidural anesthesia as carefully and safely as we can. If it does not work, if it fails for whatever reason, and we have to put her on the ventilator, then she's on the ventilator anyway. So I went back to the patient and said, you know what? I talked to your attending and uh, we decided we're going to give this we're going to do this under epidural. And I think we can do that. Uh, we did that. She did just fine. Um, she got discharged uh, about three days later or as her, as her COVID symptoms resolved. Um, and I haven't kept up with her, but, uh, but I assume she did fine. She was sent home off oxygen. And uh, later the co-surgeon that worked with her, this uh, obstetrician that I get along great with, I said, look, I haven't seen Dr. So-and-so in a while, but I said, I want you to tell her, uh, to, I want you to tell her thank you uh, for convincing me to do something that I, I didn't think, you know, I wasn't comfortable with at first, but she convinced me. So you can put that feather in her cap. I don't care. May boost her ego. I really don't care. Um, so I think that's a case that not only illustrates just kind of the scenarios we get into with COVID, um, but also the professionalism that, that I would encourage all of you uh, to engage in. Now, there's two types of patients in COVID. There's people that get sick from COVID, right? And that's one we think of. But then the other category are people that break their ankle or just do whatever. And then, oh, by the way, they get tested and they have COVID. They may be asymptomatic. So those are the two types of patients in the COVID unit. It's not just people that have COVID. It's people that have all the other problems that people continue to have. They have a heart attack, whatever, gallbladder disease. They have to have surgery. They have to have a procedure. They just happen to test positive for COVID. 
they may not ever get sick with COVID. And so that's the other side to the, the patient population in the COVID unit. Dr. Trousdale, this is uh, Gil Salazar from Emergency Medicine. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks. I uh, kind of comment and a question. Anesthesia and emergency medicine have a, this uh, kind of really nice relationship, but we only get to see each other when there is a patient who is so sick with a really bad, difficult airway and right. we're having trouble. So when, when we call you guys, we're really in a lot of trouble. Can you share <laughs> with with us kind of your mindset when you get a call from one of us in the department, if we're having trouble, it's sure. probably a, gonna be a difficult one. And thank you. So, it's funny you say that because I, about a year ago, a few years ago, I was, uh, I always tell my residents say, look, if you wanna handle the airways on your own, that's fine. If you need my help, I mean, you sh the anesthesia resident should be able to handle most airways. But I said, if there's any red flags or anything that concerns you, just call me, I'll be there, that's fine. But you don't have to call me every time. However, if you ever get called to the ER for an airway, you call me and I come down with you. So one of the difficulties, and I actually have not had this trouble in a long time. Maybe just we get along better. But this one resident I got called to, it wasn't just an airway. It was, they want to do an awake nasal intubation in the ER. And I said, no, 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 we're going to go down there. So I respect what you guys do. Um, but my philosophy, whether I'm in the ER, the ICU, sometimes I go to the ICU just to give ICU as an example, and there's a medical student or a fellow resident says, can I intubate? And what I do, I actually carry a card in my pocket now. So I, I've learned to diffuse the situation. I said, look, you call me and you can, you can spend a whole day intubating with me, but you called me today because you needed help. So um, it's not time to, to mess around. And so, um, and that usually works really well. I just say, hey, I know, I know you want to do this and learn as a teaching hospital, but, but not right now. And I, I say for this one patient, I'll give you 10 intubations, you know, it's fine. So when I do get called on the ER, the, the difficult thing that we have to do is something is in progress and it's not my, it's not my wheelhouse, right? And so getting back to, you know, hell is other people and, and dealing with people is, is, is the most challenging thing is the most challenging thing is to uh, kind of sometimes convince that ER physician that maybe it's worse than they think, or maybe trying a fifth time is not the best thing. Now, one time as a resident, I physically kind of pushed the resident out of the way. And I remember, I don't think it was you, Dr. Fowler was the attending, but I remember the resident just looked up at, the, at their attending with these puppy dog eyes, like you're letting them get away with this. But I physically just was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I felt like, look, you've tried three times. There's blood everywhere. Um, it's time to give me a try. So um, that having been said, if there's someone junior below me that has an idea or has something, I'm not averse to letting someone, you know, participate or whatever. What was interesting about the call I got called to in the ER though was, they were trying to do nasal intubation. We called e ENT early and it was a junior level ENT resident and it was the ER doc and they kept wanting to keep trying. And we looked at the airway and it was about the size of a pinhole. So it was, um, what's it called? It was, um, I'm blanking on it, angioedema, right? So the entire air airway closes. And my biggest task was not just the airway management, it was convincing the ER doc and the ENT resident that we had to go straight up to the OR. And the ENT resident did not want to call his attending and he kind of saw that as like a fail. And I said, I don't care. I said, we're, it's a long story what happened, but basically his airway completely closed up in the, uh, in the ride up on the elevator. And the, I'll just tell you that sharing an airspace with the ENT surgeons and my, my resident, um, there were, there were finger mark marks on the, on the patient's face and jaw from us trying to grab his jaw and, and move air. And we're about an inch away from where this, the surgeons work. And we saved that patient's life. Um, it's one of the very few just like skins on the wall, like saves. I never got a letter from him or thank you note or whatever, but um, uh, it's probably the worst airway I've had in that, in that sense. And uh, it felt like a win. It was, it was really cool. So did that answer your question? It's, it's the, it's the human side of dealing with someone and just, okay, here's where we take over, but you have to do it in a, in a, in a smooth way. And you know, if you can. Well, for sure. And all the cross training that we do together, uh, to teach our residents a uh, difficult airway algorithms and management has been absolutely life-changing so that we really don't get to see you guys uh, very often downstairs. We really appreciate having that luxury of having you guys around for a really, really bad day. So are you, are you at Parkland? Yes, sir. So one thing I do, actually, one, the other place that we do see each other is you have your ER rotators come up and do airway? Yes, sir. And so you look at it as an, your residents look at it as an opportunity to learn airway, but I use it as an opportunity to 
maybe demonstrate some humility if it's a difficult airway, but that's where I get to know the resident. I learned their name. So I've actually incorporated that in my practice. So when I'm in what's called the eggs room, which they're not going to know what that means, but eggs is basically just our 24 hour uh, general surgery room. What I do, what I started to do when I came to Parkland is if I have a CRNA who's obviously intubated many times, I will grab a student or a general surgery resident and say, do you want to do airway? And they're just like elated. Uh, so I let them manage the airway, but my ulterior motive actually is not just to teach them airway. It's that's how I get to know them and I get to work with them in a way that I wouldn't otherwise. And I don't know if we have time, but there's a long story about this resident I got to know very well. And it actually reaps dividends when he was, uh, he was a difficult husband on the OB side uh, when his wife was delivering. And uh, only because I knew him from that experience, I was able to kind of come in and, uh, and diffuse the situation. So um, that's why I do that. <laughs> okay, another question. Uh, is it true that anesthesiology jobs are becoming more difficult to get because hospitals are hiring more nurse anesthetists instead? So, and, yeah. And like part of that is, what do you think about the increasing role of CRNAs in your field? So that's been an issue since forever. So actually when I joined anesthesia, so I mentioned that my fraternity brother uh, convinced me to do anesthesia or work as an anesthesia tech. What's interesting about that is he actually decided not to go into anesthesia. He went into medicine instead because he was so concerned that we wouldn't have a job. It was at a really difficult time when a uh, few people applied. Um, I was competitive, but it was easy to get into anesthesia at the time. So I got in at a good time. That's been a constant threat. Um, I don't personally worry about it. I our job has gotten more difficult in the sense that medicine has gotten more complex. The patients are getting sicker. You're not just doing a, uh, an EVAR on a patient to fix their aneurysm. You're doing the third time redo. And so patients are getting sicker and more complex with always the expectation that they live. With regards to CRNAs though, I work very well with them. We work in a team approach. Um, there's always politics involved. Um, I feel like there's still a future if, if, students want to go into anesthesia. I don't discourage anyone. Um, I don't think anything happens overnight. If it looked like more and more that they're going to take uh, that role, then I've always said, then I'll, I'll find something else to do, but I enjoyed enough to where I'm, I'm willing to stick in. I don't personally worry about it. Um, we always play a role and have a value because we have that medical education, not to distract from or criticize the role that CRNAs have, um, but we do provide a certain value to the hospitals and to the surgeons. And so I'm not personally worried about that. In all your years working, was there ever a time when you uh, either reconsidered the field of medicine, like if you wanted, like going to med school or doing something different? Sure. And also going along with that, has physiology been too repetitive for you? So I'm not sure how to answer the second question. The first question, there's always moments. I had a really difficult time. <clears throat> My first really inpatient rotation um, I had a really difficult L and D experience where it just was, it was my first time to do overnight call. And we, this is before the hours were in place. And so, I mean, you'd be up for 36 hours and it was really difficult because our chief and our attending, we thought we were working really hard. My, the other student and I were working as hard as I've ever worked. And then it was really deflating to hear from our chief, like, Hey, could you guys kind of like pick up the, pick up the weight a little bit. And so, um, again, it was that human element, um, so that was a, a kind of a low point. And then during the internship, uh, I actually started with surgery and switched to anesthesia. And I was just in a really bad program. And uh, I thought it was me. And I was like, I, I just don't think I can hack it. And so I switched to anesthesia at Parkland. And I realized it wasn't me. It was, the <laughs> you hate to be the student that blames their professor for the bad grade, but um, it was a very bad environment to thrive in. And it was extremely sink or swim. But I figured out on my first call night, uh, the morning after my first call night, that you're going to get yelled at for some. This is a different time, obviously. You're going to get yelled at for something, but the the goal is to figure out the least. Um, if you're going to get yelled at something about doing something or not doing something, make sure it's not something important. So your goal is to figure out what's important and to prioritize. So some the surgeon, the chief is going to get mad at you because you didn't perform uh, in some way or another, but to prioritize what's uh, where the criticism should go. And that was just an awful way to learn. So the second question, I'm not really sure what they were asking. 
Well, moving on from that one. Um, so I know you talked about earlier the uh, like you were interested in doing a general uh, general anesthetic on the patient, but you were convinced otherwise. In general, do surgeons dictate any part of the anesthesia, or are you the one primarily in control? So it's always a discussion. I think things have gotten a lot better. Again, this is something I lecture on uh, pretty frequently is that when I trained, we were like, you know, oil and water, two ships passing in the night. And so um, it's so hard to believe that, but but it used to be like our attending would be like, we're going to do this. And like, we don't even care what the surgeons think. I know that's hard to believe and it sounds awful, but um, a few things have happened. One is we have what are called the ERAS protocols, E-R-A-S, I forget what it stands for, but uh, basically we have these shared uh, agreed upon protocols for, for pre-op, intra-op, and post-op care. Now we do that because it's uh, safest and best for the patients and it's evidence-driven. I think that's what the E stands for. Um, but what I found, and I can't prove it, there's not a study that shows this, but I, I'm pretty convinced that what it also does is it allows us to reduce conflicts because we don't argue over this or that. So what's happened since when I left Parkland in the past 15 years, 20 years, is that um, we come up with a plan, we communicate, and so it's rarely at odds. Now, sometimes a surgeon wants to do something that's not realistic, but they, if they trust me enough, they understand if I say, well, that's not, that's not really going to happen or whatever. Um, so those kind of conflicts um, are greatly reduced when your anesthesia department is very good about communicating and educating that surgical side. And we're seeing that on the L&D side. We just recently introduced this a special type of block called a tap block, and we're only able to do it in patients because we've put the the mileage in, we put the time and the effort into convincing the obstetrics department that the, the patients will benefit from it. So uh, there are conflicts. Um, you have surgeons that don't like blocks, even though when you know a block is indicated. And so you want to do what's best for the patient, but um, you have to please that other patient too at times, right? You have to, you have to kind of uh, compromise with the surgeon at times. Have you ever worked with a, with a patient whose body didn't have a reaction to anesthesia? Um, everybody's different. So there was one patient I had many years ago that I gave a massive amount of uh, propofol and they were still moving and still moving. I felt like they weren't. Uh, so here's the thing. Patients, um, everybody's different. And so you never know what patients are on. My, I'm convinced a patient was on some kind of stimulant. People take all kinds of crazy stuff. And you see this in the ER too, uh, whether it's herbal supplements or there's illicit drugs that we know about, right? And there's a whole host of things that people just buy off the street that has God knows what in it. So I think he was on some kind of stimulant. Um, but I've never had someone that I attempted to give an anesthetic and then they had just total awareness, for example. So every patient's different, um, but... Um, I do, I did have one patient in particular, actually, I, I had another patient one time that as I'm t dialing down the anesthetic gas, all of these are based on studies based on averages, right? So I did everything, you know, by the book, by standard of care, but I'm slowly turning down the volatile anesthetic and still at a very high level that most patients would be completely immobile. And the patient wakes up, uh, opens her eyes wide awake. And I look at the monitor to make sure it was you know working. She had no awareness during the surgery. Uh, but she woke up incredibly crisp and awake and alert just as she was before the surgery. And I just think by lucky stars that she didn't have awareness during the procedure, but it was, you know, I'd had the volatile anesthetic at a really high level. So it wasn't like it was, you know, substandard anesthetic levels or whatever, but that was kind of scary because I thought, Ooh, I mean, she's, she's awake right now. And I just started to turn on the anesthetic. So that was kind of a, that was an odd situation that thankfully uh, did not, you know, didn't have any problems. Uh, speaking of the total awareness, uh, or actually, never mind. Uh, another question. I know you talked about this uh, a bit before, but how much patient interaction do you really have as, as an anesthesiologist? About as much as you'd want. <laughs> so, um, you know, people talk about continuity of care. Honestly, I probably spend as much time with my patients, which is a decent amount of time in the preoperative area, sometimes in the post-op. I probably spend as, as much as we talk about continuity of care and the 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 one-on-one -on -one that the family medicine doctors have with their patients and that sort of thing, they probably spend about the same amount of time that we do uh, in the pre-op area, uh, just because they have very limited time. Um, I spend more time in the pre-op clinic uh, just because as I tell everybody, I'm pre-oping for the world. So if, it, if I'm pre-oping for myself, my note may look more minimal, 
But when I pre-op a patient in the clinic, I have to dig a little deeper because I don't want to send it to a colleague that's going to be like, oh, why didn't you do this or do that? And so I'll spend a little bit more time with them. But we honestly spend the same amount of time with our patients that, that regular doctors do. So it's not like we don't see our patients. We don't deal with our patients. We also deal with patients at their most difficult moments a lot of times. And so um, I'm a little old school in this sense in that we've gone such the other way on the pendulum on informed consent that we're not really informing the patients, right? And so what I tell my trainees is there are appropriate times to tell the patient they could die. There's an appropriate time to tell them they could be on the ventilator after the procedure, but it's not every single patient. You don't tell a 24 year old healthy patient that's gonna have their gallbladder taken out. Uh, you may, I, I don't, and I know I have colleagues that vehemently disagree with me. Um, I even had a patient a while back that was a lawyer, very pleasant woman, and after I'm done with my pre-op or pre-op interview, she's like, I noticed you didn't mention death. I said, ma'am, I don't think you're going to die today. I think it's extremely unlikely you're going to die today. I think it was more dangerous for you to drive on Dallas city streets uh, to get here. Uh, I don't think you're going to die. It's a low risk surgery. You're a low risk patient. So I'm not going to tell you you're going to die if I don't think you can. And I'm, I'm sorry. So she was disappointed in that, but, but um, that's just my philosophy. I, I think you don't want to give patients false expectations and just tell them only good news. But at the same time, your job is not to scare the bejesus out of every patient. And so um, they look to you to reassure them. They've already trusted that surgeon, right? They've seen the surgeon. They The surgeon can be a stone cold killer like Christopher Dunch um, and be dangerous, but they've already in their mind accepted that, um, that risk. And so when they see you, what they're worried about, which is what Dr. Fowler and I talked about for the talk, is that unknown. They're, they're afraid of someone taking control of their whole life in a way that the, the surgeon doesn't. Um, so I spend plenty of time talking to patients um, um, and really a lot of times gets to know them just as much as, as a busy primary care clinic in that sense. What's your uh, favorite part of being an anesthesiologist? I like the variety. And the other thing I like is, um, you know, after a while, the anesthesia part kind of be, can become uh, second nature. And so I'm, I'm a person of very small, uh, simple needs. And so what I look at when I look at the schedule the day before is who I'm working with. And maybe, it's, you know, silly things like, do they have bad taste in music? I don't want to work with someone for 12 hours. They have awful taste in music or, uh, or they're just awful to work with. And so the thing that I like about what I do is the, the personal interaction. It's the OR is a fun place. Um, maybe fun is not the right word, but it's, a, it's definitely like the, the nurses and the, the staff that are in there, they, it's a special place, I should say, because it's, um, you know, we've, we feel like it's just kind of a different special area of the hospital. Um, every specialty bags on every other specialty. So I'm not going to trash the other specialties, but um, it is funny when I convey to friends some of the things we say about other specialties, other surgeons. And, and uh, I had a friend that was really shocked by it. I was like, you guys talk about, you know, that badly about each other. Like, yeah, everybody talks badly about each other. Um, but what I like about the OR and the anesthesia and surgery together is that it, it feels like just sort of like a special place in the hospital. And of course, everybody thinks they're better than everybody else. Um, but uh, we like the kind of problems that we get to deal with. It's a, it's very much a team approach in a way that other areas of the hospital aren't often. Evan Trousdale, what a wonderful talk you've given us tonight. I mean, this was such an enlarging and stimulating uh, discussion that ranged in so many areas from pain management to uh, awakening under anesthesia to why you did all this to begin with. And I, on behalf of uh, our virtual shadowing team and the roughly 26,000 people who have signed up on this website, you were talking to 1,200, <clears throat> right at 1,200 participants tonight, Devin. So this was a very popular talk for us. Thanks. Um, any parting uh, shots for the group? I have, um, if I have one quick minute, I promise you I would tell the crazy story about my Portugal trip, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna exceed my time if I can. Can I tell you all? No, no about please. So my daughter's under my chair here. She's at, she's supposed to be in bed. So, um, so she was there. So I'll try to make this short. We went to Portugal or we planned this trip to go to Portugal, right? For two weeks, took time off for spring break. We made all these arrangements with the teachers. I taught the girls Portuguese. Um, we looked up YouTube videos. We did all this research. And then um, 
the day that we're supposed to leave, I open up our safe and get our passports and I realized my passports expired. And uh, so my, I told my wife and she said, is this one of your pranks? And I said, no, I, I don't have a passport basically. So we almost canceled the trip. Um, it was gonna be expensive to reschedule and we were this close to canceling the trip. And we'd left a message with a friend that travels a lot. And she's like, get me the phone and let me talk to your wife. So she talks to my wife, she's like, can you handle the girls for a few days? My wife says, yes. So I put my wife and my daughters on a plane by themselves. I stayed home and uh, had no idea how I was gonna get my, my passport. And I called the state department. They actually have a great 24 hour hotline by the way. And uh, they said, look, show up in Dallas on Monday. I'm not gonna promise this, but if you, if you beg and plead, they have it within their capacity to print the passport. So I show up first thing Monday morning, they print the passport. I get it that afternoon, I fly the next day. Before I get on the plane though, on that Tuesday to join up with my wife and daughters who are already in Portugal, I have the passport in my hand with my wallet on my phone because I don't wanna lose it, right? I don't want some TSA agent to drop it or whatever. I go through TSA, I'm sitting down eating lunch, it's 12 o'clock, the plane doesn't leave till two, I have plenty of time. I hear my name called overhead, please pick up your passport at the TSA. Somehow I dropped it and didn't notice it. My wife is gonna kill me. I mean, I'm just cursing, cursing, cursing. I can't find this TSA post. I, I don't know where this lady is calling my name. So I turn on my phone. This is a, this is a win for Parkland, right? I turn on my phone, immediately I get this phone call from a flight attendant. She says, this is Wanda. I'm a, I'm a flight attendant, I have your passport. She's at gate 22, I'm at gate 40. I run over to her, I'm like, how did you find my phone number? She said, well, uh, you dropped your passport. We didn't see who dropped it. We looked at your name, it's a unique name. We looked you up on Facebook. We saw that you worked for Parkland. We called Parkland and the operator said, that sounds pretty important. And they gave us your personal cell phone number. So I reunited with my password that I lost. I told my wife all this for some reason. Uh, we joined up again in Portugal. And so uh, the eight of the, the, the 12 of the 14 days I spent with them and it was a great trip. So it's a wonderful place to travel to. So I actually check all my IDs uh, January 1st of every year, driver's license, passport, insurance, make sure everything's up to speed. But uh, it was pretty embarrassing to be like an international traveler and not realize your passport is basically uh, dead, <laughs> no use. So that that's the short version of it. But yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> Well, Devin, on behalf of the very grateful virtual shadowing team and our large family in uh, 740 universities worldwide, we just want to tell you how much we appreciate you coming and uh, showing your humanity. And there's a thousand kids right now saying thank you on chat right now. So, <laughs> well, I appreciate the opportunity. It's it's been great. I enjoyed this. Okay, so we have one more slide, I think, Rohit, don't we? Um, yes put the exam, can you forward the slide? There we are. Here's the Questbase info for the quiz. Uh, you'll go to questbase.com and go to find assessment where you can type in the pin and you'll need the password, which is Drowsdale, all lowercase. Uh, the due date will be uh, the 20th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, just before our next session starts. And just so that you know, you do not need a Questbase account to do the quiz. Well, again, Devin, thank you so much. Uh, to my fellow physicians on the line, Brandon and Gil, thank you so much for coming. And to every one of you that can still hear our voices, we want to thank you so much. And we will see you next week. And all of you have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>